good evening ladies and gentlemen my wonderful team dream team i requested uh, shail that i will stand up and talk because for many of the advocates we talk only when we are standing sitting is not possible so please excuse me i'll be turning here and talking to you asg as uh, rightly said he is on his way today he had a very important uh, uh, matter in the supreme court he just completed in on his way and i have a brief part to introduce him to you in my own language which i'll be doing when he is entering the dais so the first two sessions of course first uh, one extended 15 minutes and the second uh, was about 10 minutes i don't know whether we can cover up in this we'll try to this session is going to be what i have uh, i mean i have taken questions from uh, my distinguished audience also this session is going to be more on a, a kind of a critical session about gst so if you are expecting a neutral uh, very passive uh, approach then i may i think you may be in for a disappointment this is going to be a bit intense introduction part every i mean she has done a wonderful introduction of everyone so i'll skip that part and i will just get into the group my first question though it is to asg when he comes i'll ask ask him i'll start with mr mani mr mani of course is a very very distinguished uh, uh, pa panelist here because he's from deloitte with a very very envious experience of over 30 years in the indirect access so i'll start with mr mani sir my first question to you would be in this budget there is a very silent introduction of a section called section 70, uh, 74a there are two sections in gst one is section 73 and one is section 74 the earlier sections of uh, in stoel excise law or service tax law we had two things called in section 11a there'll be one with the non suppression and one with suppression suppression will have more uh, i mean it will be more nauseating because you will have a 100% penalty you will have a demand period stretched to 5 years 60 months whereas non suppression cases would be normally having a, a limited that is itself wrong because as uh, mr lakshmi gopran when you were saying when the ruled and the ruler state was there in uh, during the english period the demand of indirect taxes was 3 months slowly in 1977 it went to 6 months thereafter in 2000 they slowly made it to 1 year and 2016 i think it made into, it was made into 2 years correct me pardon me if the number of I mean, the years are correct, uh, not correct but the sum and substance is it was slowly escalated from the ruler ruled state to a welfare state the demand on non suppression cases got enlarged from the three months in 1944 to six months and one year and two years and when gst was introduced silently it was made into three years i'm talking about non-suppression cases the suppression cases all uh, were always five years i have no uh, complaints about it but about genuine genuine taxpayer we are talking about a non suppression genuine ta taxpayer who has not paid because of a interpretational dispute a contributory negligence because the department also would have said a, a wrong thing and we are talking about an indirect tax rightly pointed out mr uh, by mr lakshmi kumar we are talking about an indirect tax going back 36 months and collecting the tax or and paying a, a humongous interest and a penalty is nothing but making it a direct tax and a direct penalty now enlarging it from three months to now three years itself i feel that it is wrong it is wrong w r o n g capital and both now in this new section 74a which was introduced in this finance bill and it is going to take effect from 1 4 2024 they have made a very clever, a very subtle, and a very wrong, another wrongful proposition, where 
they have made 73 and 74 sandwiched into one. And they have said that hereafter the demand period will be 42 months. Which means, there will be a non-suppression cases, there will be 42 months of demand. 42 months they will go back and issue you a shock house notice and they are going to adjudicate 42 months. From where we started, three months rule uh, English state to a welfare state of 42 months. And that too, not 42 months. The 42 months is from the date of the annual return. For one for two, uh, for uh, say for example, one for 2022, the annual return is in uh, November of the next financial year. And from that November, it starts 42 months, which means for one for 2022, they will be having around what 12 plus 6, 7, uh, 19 plus 42, 61 months of demand period for a genuine taxpayer who has not suppressed anything, no willful misstatement, nothing. This has come, I feel it is a curse in disguise. I want none other than Mr. Mani to comment on this provision, 74, because it has not been advertised properly, it has not come into the uh, I mean, notice of many, no bigger objections have been raised. I take this podium, I take this stage to launch my first outburst protest on this and I would like to have Mr. Mani's views on that. Over to you, sir. It's a very long question, but I think what you are asking essentially is whether an extended period of limitation is in order or not in order. To which there is only one question, it is obviously not in order. I mean, there is no two views on, you know, can we have 42 months, 36 months or anything. I mean, it's obviously not done. And while expecting it to be three months or six months, which was there in central excise and salt tax long back, maybe, you know, difficult. In, in any situation, having it at a reasonable time, I guess, is a very valid ask of all taxpayers and all businesses. And let me put it in a different context to what you, you know, said. See, in the erstwhile regime, the central excise regime and the service tax regime, the central excise regime had a process of manual return filing. It was not a technology enabled filing. In the GST, from the beginning, we have had a conscious process of enormous technological abilities. There were some hiccups initially, but the government was very proactive about it. GSTN took a lot of steps during the initial first two years. And over the last two, three years, it has been working very, very smoothly, by and large. So in a situation where a business is expected to file two returns every month, make a payment every month, the first issue that would come up is if that return needs to be assessed, why should the assessment start only on filing of the annual return? Because if there is an input tax credit which is incorrectly taken, the tax authorities typically do not wait till the end, till the filing of the annual return to come back to us and say, you took incorrect input tax credit. That happens within three months, six months, as soon as they come to know. Consequently, the starting period for any period of limitation should be the date when the monthly return is filed. It cannot be 15 months after that or eight months after that. The second point is, when we talk of extended period of limitation and suppression, I would prefer using a different term. I would say, Cases that have a bona fide intention and cases that have, have a malafide intention. Now, experience teaches us and all the past laws relating to service tax and excise and VAT teaches us that malafide is typically something like maybe 5% or 10% or if that is stretched, maybe 15%. 85 to 90% are bona fide transactions. In the context of GST, bona fide transactions are very important to acknowledge because during the initial period of the GST legislation, for the first two to three years, in addition to the technology challenges that all businesses faced, the law also kept changing. The rates were changed multiple times. 
GST also, despite having completed seven years, we do not have the benefit of having a GST tribunal. In that situation, it is quite possible with technology challenges during the initial period, with the law changing constantly during the initial period, advanced ruling authority sometimes giving contradictory decision, a business may end up making a very genuine mistake. Now, that genuine mistake needs to be rectified. And there needs to be a forum for that rectification. In today's context, that forum is not available in the context of a tribunal even now as we speak. Consequently, when we speak of what is bona fide error of judgment of a business and what is malified error of judgment of a business, for the initial five years or so of GST, it has to be taken in a very liberal manner, in a manner which trusts businesses. And this trust is mandated by the fact that the GST collections have been on the upswing. When the GST collections are on the upswing, some part of the credit certainly should go to the tax authorities and policy makers for the efforts they put in for that. But some part of that credit for the increased GST collections also need to, the business, need to go to the businesses that are contributing to the GST. Because they see benefit in that contribution and they feel that it is their duty to pay the right GST. So keeping all this in the background, when we come to the question of what should be the right period of limitation, should it first answer is, it has to be different for bona fide mistakes and malafide errors. If it is a bona fide mistake, the ideal period which is used in many other jurisdictions typically is 12 months. If within a year there is a bona fide mistake, it needs to be rectified. For malafide errors, it can be much more. It can be three years or four years or whatever be the period. But between the two, there needs to be a distinction and the time limit for any redressal on bona fide mistakes has to be lower. To be fair to the tax authorities, we also have to bear in mind that the two years that we lost due to the pandemic. And during that period, the time limit for filing annual returns got extended repeatedly. Consequently, at the present point of time, when the returns are being assessed and audits are being conducted, they are starting from the period of July 2017 and coming all the way till March of 22. So four years audit is happening simultaneously. Possibly what can be done is to give a window for this first four years audit. And once this four year audit ends, have a time limit which is very straight and says, it's a year at best if there is a bona fide mistake. It can be three years or four years for a malafide error. It cannot obviously be the same. And businesses cannot be expected to live in uncertainty four years down the line. Because imagine the situations that could arise. A business is in discussions with a potential acquirer or an investment banker where someone is acquiring the business. And the person acquiring the business knows that a GST demand could prop up even three years after they have started operating that business. How do they operate? Do they put the entire money in an escrow? Do they take indemnities for every single tax risk? It will not happen. Similarly, every business operates on the principle of credibility. So if the business in front is a credible business, that can be ascertained by looking at their GST returns and looking at their customer profile and vendor profile. Just one more point to end is to a large extent, the bona fide malafide distinction with possibly the GST authorities struggle to decide because they have to undergo a process of audit to do that can also be addressed if we go back to the GST compliance rating. I think the GST law when it was enacted had a section on GST compliance rating. Unless I'm mistaken, it was section 171. Correct. So if section 171, which is already enacted, is given force to and the data to enable section 171 is already available with the GSTN. Because the customer profiles, the vendor profiles, the monthly payments, the credit taken correctly, the credit taken incorrectly, the credit reversal, everything is there in terms of the electronic database that the government has developed. 
consequently implementing section 171 and coming with a compliance rating would in today's situation be possible for them if they do that they can also have rules which say that if your compliance rating is let us say more than 7 out of 10 then we presume that you are a law abiding taxpayer the onus of proving that you are non compliant is on the revenue whereas for businesses which are below 5 on a scale of 10 the onus is on the business to prove that they are compliant if we follow some kind of an approach like this with various modifications and various safeguards this will possibly protect the business and also protect the interest of the revenue thank you mr mani and we have uh, our asg mr n vengatraman on stage welcome sir Allow me, having heard the trade side, I am from Revenue Service at present in on deputation to GSTN. I have been in ministry for eight years between 2012 and 20 when the law was crafted. So I was part of that team. So I'll tell you as to what is the perspective from government side since there is nobody to tell, I am taking the liberty of stating what is the I was about to come to you. So Please, you have taken the initiative. Okay, yes, so here is uh, how it will be viewed from the side of government. Though I am outside the government, I am trying to see as to what would have motivated them, them to do this. One, when there is a dispute which entails extended period of, period of time, the first item which is adjudicated in most of the cases itself is, is there an extended period of time involved here or not? and considerable part of litigation energy gets spent in that. So with this, that part of litigation has been completely removed from the uh, equation. Second, the adjudication proceedings are supposed to be based on preponderance of probability. But going by what has happened in the last 15, 20 years, in taxation matters, you, you will never find a penalty to be upheld on the basis of preponderance of probability. The, the extent of weight of evidence which is expected to be brought on record is as good as will be required in a criminal case, which, it's, which means a considerable energy of tax administrations have to be spent if penalty has to be brought in. Now what this does is that it A, removes litigation, saves energy of tax administration and assures it of the taxes. The, penal the penalty and prosecution becomes weaker. To that extent, the tax laws become more civil in nature. So this uh, amendment seen from tax administration's perspective has three clear advantages. Reduces litigation on extended period, whether it is involved or not. In most of the cases, trust me, courts will say tax confirmed, no penalty. So these are the two and three, it will be much faster. So I see three clear advantages emanating from this. Coming to the last point, which was the pain point, you have all the energy in the world to represent why 42 months, why not 36 months, why not 24 months. Go ahead and do it to, before the government. This is just a prelude, sir. We are doing that. Okay. I mean, I appreciate your, uh, I mean, what to say, your side of view. But only thing is, as you rightly said, if it boils down to penalty, of course, I'm not making it as a debate. I just want to make one observation, move on. If it is only a penalty, yes, understood. 122 is there, impose 100%, make it even 200%. But why, by giving, I mean, knocking out the uh, sting out of that entire litigation, as you say that we are moving away from only pure litigation except we are excluding the uh, ingredients part of the limitation part so make it seamless so the time of litigation will come down or, uh, is all understood but in the process you could have minimized uh, how can it be enlarged for a non-suppression genuine taxpayer 42 months on a indirect tax going behind can, I am putting myself in the shoes and I am thinking whether I can go back 42 months and ask one of my, an interpretational classification issue. Can I go back to my, I mean, my 
uh, I mean, whoever has bought from me, a buyer of, uh, or a recipient of service, can I go back to him and say that, no, no, sorry, there is a tax revision and it is on 42 months and that too with an interest, very, very importantly with an interest. So that's why, so I'm not taking it to a debate because we have been, um, I would say, a much stronger uh, AG has come. I have a very relevant question connected to this. I'll go to him right now. Can I, can I just add one to the yes, sir, string sure, of sure, sure. three or four points he has given? Yes, sir. You are right. It has, it has enlarged. But at the same time, we have made the facility this time that assuming something is confirmed after 30 months, 40 months, after all, GST essentially is a supply chain tax and therefore ITC is available. So we have permitted that. So unlike uh, in the previous regime, where you had extended period of limitation, you can't transfer your, you can't pass on your ITC. So, 42 months coupled with the fact that liability, if any, should be a pass-through cost, essential. So, I think that should be a good equalizer, is one view we can have it in mind. Maybe on an interest part, we may be having a hit, sir, which we will come to it later. Yes. Now, uh, as a, I mean, shall I go to you, sir, or I will just come uh, with the flow? Because you have joined, I just want to take you on board. In fact, I have a small intro for ASG also which maybe at the last I will finish. I just want to uh, mention his introduction in my own words. I'll come to that later. Now straight to you, sir, a question for you. See, there is an amnesty scheme which was introduced in this. We, call, we can call it as amnesty, it is section 120.8a. It says that for the period 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20, for three years, am I right? Three years, right? Yeah. For three years, they have given a waiver of complete interest and penalty yeah, for the notices issued under section 73. It is nobody's guess, it is open, it is out, I mean, it is in black and white, everyone knows that today most of the notices are being issued only under 74. Even if it is 73, I will tell you a small difference why it is very important is. In S2 legacy laws like central excise, if there is going to be a notice given under Section 11A proviso, which is invoking suppression of facts, then there was a great likelihood that if you are able to succeed, that there is, I mean, to demonstrate to the court or the appellate authority or any appellate fora, that there is no suppression in that case, then the entire case would be knocked out. So, even the normal period would be endangered if you are able to demonstrate to the court there is no suppression in Section 11A, etc., etc. But in GST, they made a beautiful uh, distinction from that, where even if a notice is given in 40, 74, and if the adjudicating authority or an appellate authority is going to find that there is no suppression in that case, they can go down and confirm it only under 73. Now, we were all thinking, so now when the notices were given in 74, we had enormous confidence in the adjudication mechanism. We were thinking, yes. Someday we will demonstrate to the adjudication and get down from 74 to 73 because there is a provision. But now this amnesty is, has come only for section 73. And it comes with a definitive time frame. What will happen to the majority of cases? I have to tell you, sir, out of 800 cases, what uh, a small firm like us does, only three cases are under 73. So 97, more than 97, 98% of the cases are demanded only under 74 for two reasons, unquote, because of the time limit given to them, because there is a stretched time limit to, uh, to give a show cost notice as, as well as an order. But we were also not objecting to it because we thought that during the adjudication we can come down on 73. Now, when this amnesty came, it has come only for 73. Rightly pointed out in even the earlier uh, session, it was pointed out that the f this is the initial formative stages of GST. And this is the first major amnesty scheme which is coming to GST. While that be so, why not 74 should also be not included in that? Because I will be, there will be an equity issue where right now I will be in 74. Ultimately, I will be, I may demonstrate to any appellate fora and come under 73, but I would have missed this bus because this comes with a, a sunset clause which is going to be somewhere at uh, 25 uh, March or something. So, is it not a benevolent, because once we decided that we are going to give a amnesty for uh, GST, considering various reasons, should 
74 also not be factor. Yeah. Under this uh, section 74 would be the question to H. Yes. Yes. Uh, we'll try to disclose as, uh, as much as possible on this. Technically, in the past, we have not distinguished before extended period and the normal period. Exactly. Whenever we went for a Samadhan scheme exactly. or a settlement scheme. But you must understand, uh, GST is a dual setup. The union and states are equal partners. So, we personally, center may not have a big issue on this. Even many states don't have an issue. This was discussed very intensely. It's not that uh, this has not been considered or factored in the discussion points. Some of these states are reluctant. To them, when notices are issued under the extended period, why not impose penalty and interest? So, as far as possible, these issues, we need to arrive consensus and unanimity. And therefore, we have left it there. This, uh, we, we, there's nothing to blame or each one has a stand and each federal partner has a right. So, a few states had some reservations and therefore, we couldn't make it universal. All right. Now, you still have a chance, the window between November and whatever March or whatever time it is, try to get the adjudication decided. And suppose you are able to bring your case under 73, post the adjudication. Maybe you can, you can try your luck, because after all, it will be a decision ultimately under 73. So, you can explore that window at the moment. Otherwise, this is where it stands. It's a policy call, and uh, unless there is consensus, we can't allow a policy to get implemented. It stands there. Thank you, Sunil. I have an academic curiosity. Arising from what he said, that will it be possible for someone who has received a notice under 74 still to make an application and request that keep it pending? I'm fighting out 74 because I'll actually fall under 73. It's like this. See, all these schemes are uh, in the nature of a contract. So, every contract is time bound. So, a statutory framework is also time bound. We can't keep it uh, open and endless. It will have its own ramifications. Yeah. Thank you for a very important and sensible question, sir. That's also a very good uh, approach to it because we can apply in 73 because I believe it is 73. But unfortunately, it is not provided. No. It's okay. Then I will come to you, sir. Your question is, see, when we started GST, with, uh, it came with a, I mean, a lot of things were uh, on the table that we are going to have GST are 1, 2, and 3. And the day, I feel, personally feel that, the day 3 became 3B. Possibly, in case your demands come under 73, even at a later point of time, explore the possibility of a writ petition and a direction under 226 that during this regime, this was the scheme and therefore I should be given the benefit. No, good luck to you there. <laughs> so, we have started drafting it. <laughs> we already started drafting it. So, coming to you, sir. The GSTR 3, this original 1, 2 and 3 were in place. Much of the confusion on ITC availment would not have happened is one of my, I, mean, I sincerely feel even today. Because most of my uh, notices or my issues are only because all my end ITC complaint, I have received the goods, 16 was complaint. I have received the goods, I have used it in the manufacture, 180 days I have made a payment, everything. But only thing is my supplier has not made the payment for some reason. And uh, only because of that reason, my credit is being denied. So many notices we are having it because he either he would have been suspended, he would not have paid, etc., etc. It is possible initially we were thinking that you should not have a rogue supplier, you should not, uh, the, the chain, it is a chain and we should have our neighbors, uh, we should have good neighbors. That is what was originally uh, told. But now, it goes minus one, minus two, minus three stages which will, uh, it should ultimately make it impossible. So, had this been, uh, this uh, GSTR 3 was originally in place, then this confusion on this, at least this, this is going to contribute a very huge amount of litigation in future. This would have been eliminated. Is there a possibility? I'm not saying why it didn't come at all. I'm asking, are we in the direction? Is it end of the road that GSTR 3 is going to be a possibility? That this, at least this part of it, or is there any alternate uh, ways of thinking it that 
I can pay on, uh, now recently on scrap they have introduced reverse charge, you can pay it and take it. Can this be introduced or thought of something on value additions, I'll pay on a reverse charge and take it so that the payment part of it is proved. So because on that front I am absolutely on page with, because unless the money goes there, the credit taking here is a double GO party. I don't want that. So is there a mechanism for that? Is it GST and working towards that? There are, uh, what is being done at present is, uh, first, why GSTR 1, 2, 3 did not come? Two reasons. GSTR 1, 2, 3 was designed by the officers without taking into consideration as to can technology implement it. In technology, there is a certain design think of technology which has to be embedded in law if it has to actually start playing, start getting implemented. So what you now have is an invoice management system getting introduced on experimental basis from 1st of October. For the first time, what you will have is on the buyer side accounting starts. If you see the journey of GST invoices, it's a very interesting journey. Initially, industry went to the government to say GSTR 1, 2, 3 is very complex, will not be able to comply, don't implement. And I was in North Block, I know it that it was on industry's demand that GSTR 1, 2, 3 was not implemented. Because reporting invoice on a portal was not part of the discipline of the industry. Look at the GSTR 1 filing, entire data is on the portal, I have made it available. For first two years, GSTR 1 filing percentage was 40%. Industry was used to the idea that I am entitled to credit if there exists a paper invoice, it is not relevant whether the supplier has even reported that invoice in his GSTR 1 or not. So that first course correction was get the industry to get into the habit of filing of GSTR 1. Then came that in the GSTR 1, the value of invoices reported is 100, whereas what is being reported in 3B is only 70. So what was in effect happening is that you are part paying the tax. And the credit of full 100 rupees is passing by, whereas the government is getting only 70. To overcome that, pre-filled GSTR 3B and new statement GSTR 2B was given. This is the third stage of evolution where IMS is being given. To the question which is still moot in my view in the eyes of law that if I have paid the consideration, have I paid the tax also or not? And do I become entitled to ITC or not? It's a question which, which I think is a larger legal question because in indirect tax, it is the supplier who acts as the extended arm of the government to collect tax on behalf of the government and deposit it with the government. So I have no mechanism by which I can as a buyer, and I'm arguing from your side that I have paid, I cannot directly pay the tax. The only way I pay the tax is through my supplier. So if I have made my consideration to the supplier, then I have in, at least in my view, have an arguable case that the uh, tax has been paid. I do not know. It's an open question. On this, in Delhi VAT, a very good judgment exists by an honorable, uh, uh, by a very honorable judge. It is still, I think, or it has got settled in Supreme Court also, wherein in favor of trade the judgment come, but in a Gujarat VAT and a uh, Tamil Nadu VAT case, the cases have gone in favor of revenue, where court has clearly taken a position that if the tax is not de deposited, then uh, credit is not available because credit is a concession and therefore all the conditions have to be strictly met. So this is the present legal play. See, on, on the legal issue, on the first aspect of this GSTR 1, 2, 3, 2, 8, 3, Bharti Airtel is a judgment on that point by the Supreme Court, uh, unraveling the whole historical development and why. As regards the second question, See, this is how government looks at it. See, genuineness of a transaction is two-sided. It cannot be one-sided as one perspective is being sought to be given, saying that supplier has to pay, is the extended arm, no doubt, in law. But we are testing the genuineness of a transaction of a buy and sell, where both parties should be genuine. Therefore, if you don't put the pressure on the buyer, if you are going to purchase it from a wrong market, encourage wrong purchases and put the blame on the purchaser, it is his obligation, then the buyer should also be faulted. So the mechanism is uh, it's actually self-stimulating. 
unless you put the pressure points at both ends it won't work because ultimately every rupee is ultimately like a cash when it comes to itc so it's a loss to that extent to the government therefore uh, the the view of delhi high court can be reconsidered because of these perspectives especially in a gst era where transparency is uh, is the order of the day and genuineness has to be the hallmark in genuineness we are trying that the kind of uh, evasion that was taking place in this uh, spurious invoices fake invoices and see what it is after 7 years the, con the considerable reduction and today we have identified as on date we have 70000 cases which are focusing with how to do this and eliminate it we have identified the industries we have identified the nexus so these things will happen in, in the future thank you sir <coughs> in fact uh, another very important question to my dear friend uh, varun see uh, this block the credits i'll come to a very another very important aspect of uh, block the credits gst was again introduced with you know we are moving towards a progressive taxation where the i feel that this block the credits or definitely a reverse gear on that and that too the constructions at least there should be a revisit but it is not being revisited is something what i feel sincerely about it i hope you we are revisiting on uh, real estate there is a committee has been appointed That's and we are seriously diagnosing all the if you have if you have any positive points to contribute yes. please send it to us and we are we are re, re, revisiting in in full in complete analysis of what can be done to the real estate uh, industry we assure you so any points see don't show only the problems suggest solutions and if it is really worth it we assure you we will extend whatever best possible cooperation on real estate rest be assured sir from tax and debts coming okay then i will have another very interesting question for you see this uh, interest on 180 days non payment see after 180 days if you are is a uh, first of all it is a privy between me and my supplier or me and my buyer and the government coming inside maybe for a noble initiative that they wanted to expedite a msme initiative that they have to ensure that there should be a payment to me if at all there is a tax payment that they are ensuring that is fine but they are in, uh, interested or they are even uh, the condition says that the value of the supply has to be paid by the uh, buyer to, i mean recipient to the supplier now this is not new to because even service tax we had i believe we had 3 months uh, period for whatever now it is made into 6 months i am not getting into the bigger part of it whether uh, government has to interfere with this 180 days or not between a, a buyer and a supplier contract they should be interested only in the tax money has to be paid so that it is remitted back and they have a, a legitimate claim with my person to that apart claiming an interest on 180 days non availment because this 180 days non pay i mean uh, asking it to be reversed itself is uh, has a shape i feel it's a slippery slope apart from that asking an interest which was not there in the service tax now they have introduced that you have to reverse uh, on the 180 at the day otherwise you have to pay interest on that how do you take it sir thanks jay for the question i think uh, there are two elements i'll just allude Yes, I just alluded to the first part on block credits. I am not into the legality of it at all. Uh, Mr. Sena rightly mentioned that there are various court rulings saying credit is a concession. Uh, let it be as it may be. Uh, let it be a concession. I am not. I have no quarrel with that element at all. Uh, I am more on the quarrel of an operational element uh, for a company that has a fairly dispersed um, operation in the country. Uh, you know, GST came in with the concept of seamless credit. moment you put in an exception it an exception is a manual intervention the more there are manual interventions the more there are you are prone to errors so if i have to now there is a there is a provision in law very innocuous provision that for a 14 seater vehicle i'll get credit for a 13 seater i want there is no way for me as an operating entity to automate this wherever there is lack of automation and we've seen this in gstr1 the 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 accuracy of gstr1 has only improved over the last 5 years because people have learned how to embrace technology you can't do this for a 13 versus 14 seater that my erp will not automate it it will read from where from an invoice then i have to educate my supplier now that these are the way invoices have to just come in for every exception in section 17 it's not one off 
My only, therefore, my submission is, how much money are we collecting from a 13 versus a 14 seater? Let's let's not just talk about money. I mean, this is nothing to do with legality. If it's worth it for the country as a whole, let's keep it. Because there is expenditure incurred by the taxpayer to review this. There is expenditure incurred by the department to check whether what I've done is right or wrong. At the end of it, if we are recovering, I mean, I'm just throwing out a number, 50 crores for the country as a whole, would it be worth it? And we can go through, we want to restrict credit for one particular industry and block it because we don't think that industry deserves this credit. Absolutely, please do it. Can we do it at the HSN? I can automate the HSN. You tell me 85176290, credit is blocked. I can automate that. To that given exception, and, but credit is permitted subject to this. So then the, the norm is, an ex, is a block credit, but a certain person who falls in the exception does still take the credit. That's something that's workable. On the 180 day interest element, uh, again, credit is a concession. You can put reasonable, you can put limitations on my ability to take credit. We've come to live with that. I think the problem that I have on this particular provision is that I am a recipient of an invoice from my supplier. My supplier, as per law, is mandated to pay the tax by the 20th of the month following the month in which he's raised the invoice on me. There's no uh, concession to him not to pay the tax merely because I haven't paid the supplier. So the government's got its fair share. On the one hand, we say I should, should not get a credit if the supplier has not paid his tax. Here he's paid his tax. Because of whatever good, bad reasons, I have not paid him. I am not getting a credit. All right, fair enough. Now I have to pay interest. But I am paying interest to who? I am not paying interest to my supplier. I am paying interest to the government. Interest by its very nature is compensatory in nature. What are we compensating the government for? The government got its fair share. If the government did not get its fair share because the supplier didn't pay, the supplier has to pay that tax along with 18% interest in any case. Very true. So there's a double dipping over here. All right. I can't be penalized because of my terms of contract. I've just taken greater credit. Or for failure of contract. Then the recourse is that he has to sue me for non-performance. And the law today is not worded that if I don't pay him, if I reverse the credit even before one credit is over, a strict interpretation of the law says I still have to pay interest. So therefore, if I simply fail to pay interest for whatever reason, I land up paying, uh, sorry, fail to pay my supplier, I still land up paying interest. This has never been there in any law up till now that I am aware of. It is a taxation law. And therefore, to put this burden additionally upon a uh, taxpayer, I think can be relooked at. This is the only legal element I would say requires a judicious review or legal review. The other element of a, uh, you know, a blot credit, 17, that I'm saying. There's nothing legally wrong with it. We are just saying, does it make business sense? That's all. Thank you, sir. And I'll come to Mohan. Mohan and uh, myself are birds of same feather. He also worked in the department, design, and he's into consultancy in industry. Mohan, I have a very important question for you. On the cross-empowerment intersection. See, we'll have it, and I mean, we'll not dwell very deep in it. We'll only get into the uh, logical end of it. See, there was a section six and Section 6 empowered both the offices of CGST, SGST to you know, cross empowered for, uh, and thereafter an instruction, a circular came for audit and uh, maybe investigation, it is cross empowered. And uh, subsequently there was a circular which said that till a logical conclusion, the same person who started the investigation go, can go on. Today, it's a fact on record. We have so many notices where we have gone to the courts in very many cases where there have been parallel investigation and parallel notices for the parallel period. And there is a uh, notice by the, so for the same period, same issue by the center, by the state. And everyone says that they are cross-empowered. Should it not be a better proposition that yes, investigation audit you do, no problem. After that, hand it over because there should be a mutual trust between, I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating for only state or the state, uh, center. Whoever with whom I am registered already. Should it not be given after the, once the uh, investigation is over and the investigation report or even the show cause notice is given to the, uh, my uh, jurisdictional officer, thereafter at least there will not be a duplication and I can follow a uh, proper chain with my registered uh, jurisdiction. What is your take on that? Thank you for that uh, 
question. So, uh, absolutely right, you know, what is happening and, you know, being a representative from the industry, I would like to share this, that this is very prevalent. We are seeing investigations happening in different places and definitely the adjudicating authority is someone else. It would definitely make sense to give it back to the jurisdictional officer because the jurisdictional officer actually understands the business as well. And it would be much more easier. We have also seen in case of audits, like for example, I will give you an example. We have something called an input service distributor. We have been distributing credit, what we take at our head office to all of our branches across India. Now, the ISD is registered in Mumbai. It is audited in Mumbai. The verification happens, scrutiny happens. Now, when we distribute the credit, in each of the states, at least in a dozen states, we have got inquiries that they want to relook at all the data once again. They want to scrutinize it. Does it really make sense that it is a double work that is happening? Because the energies of the government is being expended and likewise for the industry as well. So I think this is something that needs to happen, that investigation can happen, audit can happen, show cause notice can definitely be issued, but at least make it answerable to the jurisdictional officer, and especially in audits, at least there should be clear directions that it cannot be that the same point is audited multiple times in different jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Yes, sir. Because we are <laughs> I'm currently doing a lot of these matters in different high courts, and some matters have reached the Supreme Court also. See, the logic of cross and prevent is this. <clears throat> because now we are on a dual G GST regime, States officers are unable to investigate beyond the state boundaries. And matters involving a chain of infractions in different states requires only the central officers to do. That's the design of the act. And that's the design of this architecture itself. Therefore, there are issues where, especially in fake invoices, especially in, in certain identified, this problem comes only from a set of industries. It's not so rampant everywhere. So in these cases, the logic is whoever starts it should end it last, first, without having to transfer it. When this logic is in place, if two people attempt to do it, and if there are cases of that nature, you are entitled to go to the red court and get it quashed. Rather than now trying to say, now you shift the whole exercise to the state officers, who are your jurisdictional officers. Internally, we find in many cases acts of collusion. All right? So it goes both ways. So we will have to park it there. We argued for almost seven days canon, same issue, and the Supreme Court has now reserved it. So the now 110 AAF going forward. We are now handing over the files to the port commissioners to uh, issue even the show cast notice. Earlier, the officers were issuing it. Same problem. What happens if an importer colludes with the port? You can't rule it out. You can't rule it out in, in practical sense. How, how you say that officers should be trusted, the reverse is also possible in the industry. It works both ways. So we will have to have one regime which proves to be at least uh, neutral. So that is how this has come into place. Any wrong, let's be very clear, we will support you. No authority has any right to abuse powers because he is an authority. But abuse of power by one authority or a few authorities cannot be a basis to ground the law or declare the law as illegal. That's the law for 75 years, starting from Natalia Champut Chetty, constitutional bench. Therefore, trade should now move forward. If there is going to be an abrasive act, bring it to our notice, we'll interfere. We will support you and get it quashed. But don't say that the regime, this regime should tinker, this regime should go. This will not go your way, in the way you aspire. Because there are two sides to every story. And we can't be narrating instances why it happened. We have concrete examples for implementing the circular this way. This, this is the practical thought I should give it from the common side. Due respect, senior, we are only talking about up to the investigation, we have no acquaintance. 
is only up to thereafter only about uh, anyway uh, we will not debate uh, now on this because we are also running out of time that's what i got uh, we will go to the last part of uh, our panelist mr ashish is the uh, i mean the most techno uh, tech savvy of this panel and uh, he has been working on latest technologies on uh, ai he has been a legal and risk officer in jungli now and he has something to advise i mean i have requested him of board to give him a, give us some suggestions about how effectively the government can take some inputs from this AI, uh, AI, the latest ai or the web uh, web3 applications and very briefly sir we would like to have because we are having gst and ce also on board any good suggestions yeah, on yeah. i uh, won't be a how? blocker between me and the drinks as such but uh, look i think uh, we have seen that how India has become a superpower in terms of software services. And it all started from, uh, let's say, mid-1990s, and we are still I mean, reaping the fruits. I think one of the contributors to that were very prudent and forward-looking fiscal policies. And I'm not talking only about GST. I'm talking about overall kind of fiscal policies. Because at that point of time, uh, you know, governments have recognized that what kind of future benefit this kind of industry will accrue to the India as an economy, which we boast of right now. Now, what has been the skill of India for last about 30 years, which is about very intelligent, skillful, and reasonably priced labor, right? And also the resources. Now, that hypothesis now, as we all know, is being challenged by emergence of AI technologies. When it comes to, let's say, intelligence, we have Gen AI technology, we have machine learning, when that comes to, let's say, factories and, and, and manufacturings, you know, we have robots, right? Now, uh, think of, we are talking about it in, let's say, I mean, 2047, when India will turn 100 years post. Uh, the world, the businesses, employment will not be the same what we see right now. Now, for India to really uh, take the center stage and be at a powerful position in, 20, in, in 2047, I think the government has to start thinking about the fiscal policies for the emerging technologies right now. Because post full implementation of AI, which I believe should not take more than two to three years, and why I'm saying because I myself am building some AI solutions, so I know that what kind of benefit it will accrue in next two, three years. The whole job market, the whole employment and the skill market will change. What I believe that uh, the policy makers uh, as of now consider something which is a sin industry or something which is more speculative there is a high possibility that those industries may actually become the mainstream uh, for the Indian youth to demonstrate their skill and to earn their livelihood. Second, now whether I, you know, I'm not uh, going to talk much about the gaming sector because uh, you know it's a, it's a still controversial before Supreme Court. But I mean, those are the skill set which you know people will adopt to really make a living when AI are going to replace the jobs and also factories. The second part, which I believe is a huge opportunity for India, is that when you have to build an AI system, the AI system has to be built after you do a mammoth amount of data training on AI. Now, whether you are building a legal AI or you are building a software AI or you are building any AI, you need human brains to really input the data. The output comes out, a human brain has to see the output and has to then I mean, rectify it. Multiple iteration would make a foolproof AI system in any parlance, whether it is a legal AI, tax AI, or any AI, okay? So there is a huge opportunity for India to really, you know, be a bit more, okay, futuristic and, you know, make the tax laws, make the fiscal laws more kind of conducive for emerging technologies and make it, you know, help, let's say, if I want to train AI, most of the AI training is happening on blockchain on Web3 and I want to be incentivized on something which is available on Web3. But the current ecosystem is not supporting those entrepreneurs to come set up shops in India. If I want to be a participant on that AI contribution, I cannot really earn the, uh, you know, earn the reward which will come to me on some asset which operate on Web3. So I believe that look at 2047 and start taking the fiscal position on emerging technologies right now otherwise you know i mean i don't know how much we would be able to attract or retain the talent uh, by the time we turn 2047 because your investment in infrastructure has to reap fruit the 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 economy is primarily now driven on the infrastructure investment right 
Now, after the investments have been done in three to five years, where would the people find the jobs if, let's say, AI is fully implemented? Now, I'll just end on one thing, you know, when uh, I was listening to the entire panel and, you know, I'm not an expert of, of say, GST and I was you know, applying the things to the AI which my wife is building, which is more on, on HR and legal AI, right? So, I told her, ki, yaar, apna, apna revenue model aise karna, ki aankh band karke 28% GST lagana. Don't take any panga that, no, this will come under 12%, this will come under 18%. Build your pricing in a way that you put 28% GST, even if you are building the AI to give some benefit to the poorest section of India, but it's okay, let them pay more price. You should have a peaceful sleep and put 28% GST, no interpretation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If, if all are Ashish, then we don't have place here. Thank you, sir. In fact, so... We don't have to fight with him in the Supreme Court then. Exactly. <laughs> We are coming to the business end of the uh, session. In fact, thank you, panelists. Jay, I need only one minute to just convey one message on behalf yes. of the government. I came only for that purpose. See, this is what we want to convey to you. If you can see the minutes of the last two GST meetings and uh, the solutions which we have offered where there are pending proceedings, whether it is HOBO or whether it is ESOP or whether it is this grant or research grant. So, industries or even trade bodies or even firms if you have live issues which is of general importance and if you feel you can contribute some solution to that please send it to us and uh, we are doing as much as possible in a very proactive you can see the last two minutes and three subcommittees have been formed way forward one is including they are going to work with the GST and in a big way in terms of B2C, everything, they are, all models are now in-house being planned. Therefore, I'm taking this opportunity to extend uh, a very meaningful support and cooperation from the government where there is a resolution possible and uh, it can serve the purpose in general or not anybody in specific. Then we are really looking into those aspects and try to see how best we can support, whether it's direct tax or indirect tax or corporate law don't have any reservations this what thank, thank you so much sir, i conclude, hope i receive a, i am entitled to a clap now <laughs> to conclude senior was my inspiration today i'm standing before today uh, you all today in the profession because when i met him when i was in the department he he sowed a, uh, a seed inside me which grew and which resulted me quitting the department and starting swami associates when he became ASG in Tamil Nadu, I was telling all my clients, that's going to be a huge loss for the trade. The clients asked why we will not be having a great uh, advocate for us to bat. I said, no, he's going to be on the opposite side. That is the greatest difficulty it's going to be. And it, he's proving it day in, day out. Now I have to alter, now the way what he said, and which deserves a clap, that he's even taking us for representation to the uh, GST council, I stand corrected that it is our benefit, sir, you are there. All the best and thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you. I'll request all of you to please come together for a group photo. And I'd also request Mr. R. Sridhar, core committee member, TKF, to please join me on stage and also to give a token of respect to Mr. N. Venkatraman since he joined us after the panel discussion started. Thank you so very much for uh, such an amazing panel discussion. Also, a big thank you to our moderator for the session, Sri Jay Kumar. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a big round of applause once again? Shailendra Ji presenting a token of respect to Mr. N. Venkatraman. Sir, thank you for joining us today.
Thank you. Thank you once again. For this, ladies and gentlemen, as we get ready to conclude the Tax Congress 2024, I'm inviting Mr. Ashridhar, core committee member, TKF, to join us on the dice for the final vote of thanks for Tax Congress. Over to you, sir. Yeah, very, a very perhaps engaging day and three sessions of the Tax Congress and uh, must thank all the panelists. There is no need to refer to each one of them individually by names. They are all well known. And uh, to the delegates at large who have come in huge numbers, though we have had a lot of floating, you know, people coming in for certain sessions and going away for the next and then coming back. Uh, we wish to thank each one of the participants, the panelists, and the moderators of all the sessions for having made it so interesting. In view of the lack of time, I don't think so. I'll be carrying the formalities to all our team who have been in the back end and supporting us so hard and in the sense helping us to get this event up and running. We will be thanking them separately and in view of time. Thank you everyone. Good evening. Looking forward to see you in the evening session again. Bye. <laughs>